Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church here at First United Methodist Church, Blue Springs. Welcome to our 11 a.m. traditional service. And let's give another round of applause for our joy ringers. Thank you so much, ladies. We're so glad that you're in worship with us today. I hope that there's something meaningful for you today, that you walk out of here being able to chew on something or receive some encouragement or a challenge for you today. So I'm out of breath because I was looking for something and then I came over here and sometimes it happens, but we're going to worship together. And so I want to share a few announcements going on in the life of our church. The first one is this. We actually are doing a movie night next Sunday. Uh, doors open at 5 p.m. The movie starts at 6 p.m. It's really cool. If you came last year, you remember, but we, we have a 20-foot projector screen that blows up right here in the middle of the sanctuary, and we've got free popcorn and the free movie, and then there's some snacks if you want to have a burger or hot dogs, some candy soda, things like that that can be uh, purchased for an additional nominal amount. But we just want to create an opportunity for people to come back together, to socialize, to spend some time together, and enjoy a movie as part of our uh, At the Movies movie series. So if you've got friends or family or kids, grandkids, uh, extended f- people, people in the neighborhood you want to invite, this is a great opportunity to invite people to church who maybe wouldn't come on a Sunday morning. Uh, the second thing I want to bring your attention to is you've probably seen it out in the lobby, but we've got a collection bin out there, and every month we've kind of got a different project that we try to support here in the uh, Blue Springs area. Uh, today, this month, we're actually supporting the school supply collection through Community Services League. Community Services League puts on a school kind of bizarre situation where uh, families who have trouble having margin to purchase so many of the school supplies that are required to go to school today and provide a bazaar where families can come through and they can get it for a nominal amount or for free. And so if you want to help support that, there's a there's a collection bin there and we've got more details on our website or just talk to Brooke, our missions coordinator. Uh, and that is, those are some of the updates. A reminder that we always have some updates in the bulletin, so make sure to take a look at that. And if you're not following us on social media, on Facebook, uh, or on our website, we encourage you to check that out because sometimes we share some addis- additional things on our website as well. With that being said, I want to invite you to stand as you're able for our call to worship this morning. We gather today to worship the one who created us the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyous, joyful hearts, let us worship God. And I invite you now to continue standing as you're able as we sing our first hymn together.
Please be seated. Isn't it grand that Jesus loves us? How wonderful. I'm John, the associate pastor here at uh, First Blue Springs, and I invite you now to join together in prayer. Dear God, we praise you for being our ever-present God. We thank you for giving us life along with your instruction book on how you would have us live and with love. Even though we know better, we frequently disregard your word in our daily living. God, we seek your forgiveness. God, thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit this week, encouraging, protecting, and loving children, staff, and volunteers during two simultaneous and fabulous camps. The love, discernment, and patience you gave your disciples shined brightly. We thank you and them. We thank you for the children. May your love they felt through your disciples take root and grow in them. God, our needs are great, but we know you provide. Your love will prevail. We pray for those among this congregation who are experiencing the trials of life itself. We pray that you overfill them with your love and assurance. We pray for those around the world who are experiencing the trials of cruel, unreasonable, or arbitrary use of power. We pray that you provide strength and hope to those suffering, and we pray that you soften the hearts of their abusers. Heavenly Father, may your love throw flow through each of us so that by your Spirit, each of our lives may enrich the lives of others and glorify you. Heavenly Father, develop in each of us and collectively as a congregation the godly fruit of love. May we live in love and seek to love as Christ loved. Keep us from jealousy and boastfulness And may the love of Jesus be seen in and through us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, teach us to walk in love and keep us from any unbecoming actions or ungodly motives. Identify in us any areas of our lives that discredit our witness for you. May we walk in the way of righteousness. Develop in us that spiritual fruit that does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. May we learn to live in total dependence upon you, Father, so that the beautiful fruit of love may bud and blossom and mature in our lives to your praise and glory. We pray that in the power of the Holy Spirit we may learn through obedience to develop the exquisite characteristic of Christ-like love in our lives so that you, Father, would be glorified and others would be drawn to you through your love reflected in us. We now join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, friends, we've reached the time of our service where we have a chance to give back to God a little bit of what God has given us. And so often we talk about this in abstract ways or just thank you for your generosity. But today I wanted to show you a few of the things that you've managed to support through our church this last week. Uh, We just had a camp with 140 different campers come, 40 different volunteers, and many people who offered their homes for the camp counselors who came and uh, spent some time with kids in our church building this week. So I just wanted to show you a few pictures. So here's a, a few. Uh, if we, we're just going to scroll through these really quickly. So you, there was so much energy, so much excitement this week. Uh, the kids absolutely had a blast. Here's some more. We're just going to go through a few of these really quickly. So you can see here there's kids that like they were being welcomed every single day. They were looking forward to coming every week uh, and they had a blast. We actually at one point had a fire truck come out and spray them down with water water. And then we almost had a fire truck come because one of the kids didn't know what a fire alarm was. <laughs> but it's a blessing because we know our fire system works really well here in the church now. Uh, and so we just had a blast this week. And I wanted to show you a few of these pictures because there were, there were multiple kids, I mean, 140 kids who came here who got to have a blast, who gave their parents a break, who got to hear about the story of Jesus and the story of scripture and our faith, and many who took a step in their faith because of our church. And so sometimes it feels like, hey, it, what, a church is just about what happens on Sundays. And sure, a lot happens on Sundays, but we are a church that supports our community, believes in making a difference, and believes in making a difference in the lives of the next generation. So thank you so much for supporting that and making a difference. And it makes such a difference, not just for our church, but for the lives our church impacts. And so I want to, want to, want to say there's offering baskets at each of the exits. If after service you feel a nudge to support the church in that way, we're grateful for that. A lot of people, and we've, we're standing on the shoulders of people who've believed in our church for a long time, but we're grateful for your generosity. Uh, and, and if you are looking to give to the church in a more regular way, we recommend taking a look on our website at Blue Springs U c.org slash give. So with that being said, uh, I want to invite you now to uh, join me in praying over our offering time. Creator God, we're just grateful for um, the impact that you make through this church. And what is a church other than just a group of people that are gathered together? And so together, we can do more than we can by ourselves. And so God, thank you for the impact we're able to make as a church. Thank you again for the impact um, we've had on these kids' lives this last week. And thank you for the countless effort and energy that went into this camp this last week. And God, help us to continue making an impact in people's lives week after week, day after day, year after year. Uh, We just ask you to multiply the efforts and the generosity of this church. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to enjoy our offertory music as we hear a special something from Patty.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Joyce Kerber, and I get to read today's scripture passage. Please stand as you're able for our scripture reading. The reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, friends, we are continuing a series today called At the Movies. And last week, we took a look at the movie Free Guy, which approximately 3% of people in our church had seen. And so... I'm excited to be talking about a movie that maybe more of you have seen. In fact, probably most of us have seen the movie Forrest Gump. It's actually a film that uh, came out 28 years ago, which, uh, whew, yeah, time keeps com- coming, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> But even 28 years after it came out, people still quote this movie. And there's two quotes in particular that we could probably quote here right now. And so let's finish them together. Mama always said, life is like... That's right. You never know what you're going to get. And stupid is as... Stupid does. We know this film. It made an impact. It actually, some, you know, a lot of films, they get forgotten into you know, history, but some films have a thumbprint on our culture. We can remember the impact that they've had on us. Now, if you haven't seen it or you need a refresher, Forrest Gump is a story of a young guy who was born with a crooked spine and an intellectual disability. And so initially, this causes him to be seen as an outcast. And because of his crooked spine, he has to wear these braces on his legs that are obvious wherever he goes, they kind of bring attention to him, and then that combined with his intellectual disability causes people to treat him as an outcast, as somebody who's different. And in the face full of these obstacles, his mother, played by Sally Fields, taught her son the phrase that we just said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. And if you think about it, that's actually kind of an optimistic lesson to give people. I've got a, uh, a box of chocolates right here, and maybe you had some of these when you came in today. We thought that would be a nice little uh, treat for you. But if you think about what his mom was saying, she's saying life is like a box of chocolates. Now, yeah, that, would, that would seem to indicate that life is a treat, and you're supposed to like eating it and enjoying every part of it. Uh, But in reality, if we wanted to be a little more pragmatic, maybe a little more cynical, we'd say, Forrest, life is like a box of chocolates. But every once in a while, one of those chocolates is secretly a turd. Or (laughs) there's a mouse trap, or something that'll, that's, it'll buzz you, it'll zap you with some electricity, or one of them has poison in it. You know, good luck separating those things out. Because when we think about it, life isn't just pleasant all the time, is it? It's full of all sorts of ups and downs. It's full of all sorts of different challenges. You know, his mom should have said, it's a box of chocolate, but beware. You know, you don't know what you're going to get. Meaning, you should be careful because life is really risky and there's all sorts of things that can happen. You're going to have your heart broken and lots of challenges are going to come your way. But that's not as catchy of a phrase, is it? (laughs) But think of what she was telling her son. Forrest, all the ups, all the downs, it's all a gift. It's all a gift. And sure, there's, when I open a box of chocolates, there's a few of them I don't like as much as the rest. And if you taste one and you don't like it, you put it back and you move on. <laughs> or throw it out or whatever you want until you find one that you do like. And what we see in the movie Forrest Gump is Forrest really embodies this piece of advice from his mom. Because throughout his life, he's never, he's never really sad about his circumstances. I mean, sure, he's sad, but he doesn't feel bad for himself. He, he's, never, he's never frustrated with his, his lot in life. He just takes it in, in 
kind of one, one moment at a time, one chocolate at a time, and he just decides how it's going to be, and then he moves on to the next one. And, and you see that optimism. It's not even like he's trying. It's just the way he is and the way he's living his life. He's just enjoying the chocolates he gets, even if they're challenging sometimes. And there's a special few people that Forrest just connects with and clings to and cherishes in his life. And we're going to talk about a few of those people today. But the first one that I want to mention is this uh, gal, Jenny. See, Forrest was mocked and he was ridiculed, but when he went on, his, on the bus for his first day to school, he found a friend for a lifetime. Check out this clip. So Jenny and Forrest become best of friends. And, and really, what we, is revealed to us in the movie is that they become best of friends because of the hardships that they face. Forrest said to himself, no one treated him like he was worthwhile. No one had a conversation with him. No one asked him questions. No one was curious about him except his mom and Jenny. Everyone else saw him as an outsider, someone to be avoided. But Jenny had her own issues. She had an abusive father. Uh, who, was, uh, who, who eventually was left alone. And she, as soon as she could, she left home and left him behind. And they both have these hardships in life that they were overcoming. And this kind of friendship begins a pattern for Forrest. Is even though he's been rejected over the years by, over, by more and more people, even though he's mocked, even though he's belittled, he just finds these people to love and then he clings to them for a lifetime. And Forrest eventually becomes, like the story continues, and we see him grow up together, and him and Jenny, two peas in a pot, and the story continues on, and eventually Forrest discovers that he's good at running. And one day, uh, he's being chased down by these bullies who think it's funny to make him run, flee for his life, and he'd be, the braces fly off in this cinematic moment, and he realizes he's a fantastic runner, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs away from them, and you have the classic, run, Forrest, run! And, she, and he's running, and he runs through a football field, and then they see how fast he is and he gets recruited to the football team and then he's good enough at football that he gets a scholarship to college and he goes away to college and he see him, you see him and Jenny's paths begin to diverge a little bit. And then Forrest ends up graduating from college and he joins the United States Army uh, and on the bus, just like the first scene we just saw, he meets a new friend in a very similar way. Take a look.
Okay. Uh, and, and Forrest and Bubba become friends, and they go through boot camp together, and he learns all about shrimp, and they eventually they go off to Vietnam together, and, and they, uh, they support each other, and they've got each other's backs, and they kind, of, they kind of go wherever one goes, the other goes, and they form this unlikely friendship where, again, Forrest, when he joins the military, just like on the bus when he was a kid, seat's taken, seat's taken. Faces rejection. People don't want to be are interested in him. They're not. They don't want to get to know him. And there's these people that he latches onto and he clings to them for life. Now, at the during boot camp, he uh, at one point discovers that Jenny has drifted off, and uh, through a set of circumstances, he learns that she's actually working at a local strip club. And so Forrest gets done with boot camp, and before he shipped off, he goes to visit her there, and he's horrified to see guys catcalling her and trying to grab her. And so Forrest leaps up on stage. Stage, grabs her, tries to carry her off, and she's upset with him, furious with him, and they, she, she marches off, and they end up having this fight on the bridge nearby, and, uh, and we see this conversation happen where, they, where, where, where Jenny and Forrest have this fight unlike any fight they've had before. Take a look. <laughs> And the reason I wanted us to look at that clip today is because of what she says here. You don't know what love is for us. You don't know what love is for us. Now, someone reminded me later on in the movie, he actually has a retort to her. And he says, I'm not smart, but I know what love is. And and he, he wants to let her know that, like, hey, I may not be the smartest guy. But that doesn't mean that I don't feel like you feel. It doesn't mean that I don't know what love is. And what's fascinating about this, if you actually analyze this moment, you know, when she's standing there on the bridge, she says, I wonder if I can fly off this bridge. And Forrest is so confused by this, like, what, what do you mean by this? And he's starting to look a little worried. And, he, and you see Jenny have this, this life path where, you know, she's, she's facing her inner demons here. And she's looking for love in the wrong places. And she's, she's using her looks and her physicality to get, to get ahead. And, and you see her just have this winding path where she's looking for love and can't seem to find it. And she's just, she's just lost. And, you see, and it's heartbreaking to watch her go through this. But it's fascinating because she says to Forrest, you don't know what love is. But what she discovers towards the end of the movie that he absolutely knows what love is. That Forrest embodies love more than, actually more than a lot of us. In fact, he, he would be the closest I've seen in some fictional character of embodying the love that St. Paul wrote about in, the, in his letter to Corinth. You know, last week we looked at this, and if you were here, you know, we made the, I made the comment that Paul was kind of chewing out this church because they were so immature and they were, they were, they were not acting like Christians. And so he chews them out, and, he, and then the letter continues, and we're going to be looking at chapter 13, and he gives them some advice on how they can be better and how they can model love. Now, often you'll hear this verse at weddings because it sounds romantic. But for Paul, this is not about romance. This is about how a Christian lives their life. And he says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous, which, by the way, jealousy is 
This sounds silly, but I get these confused all the time. Jealousy is when you're worried somebody's going to take something that's yours. Envy is when you want what somebody else has. Um, Homer Simpson taught me that. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts all things, hope for, hopes for all things, endures all things. And, and now I want you to, this is kind of just a silly a silly practice here. But what if we put Forrest in all this? Because if you think about how Forrest is in this movie, Forrest is patient. Forrest is kind. Forrest isn't jealous. Forrest doesn't brag. Forrest isn't arrogant. Forrest isn't rude. He doesn't seek his own advantage. He isn't irritable. He doesn't keep a record of complaints. People treat him terrible. He isn't happy with injustice, but is happy with the truth. He puts up with all things. He trusts in things. He hopes in all things, and he endures all things. It's kind of funny, huh? Maybe Forrest knows what love is after all, at least how they wrote him. And uh, and Jesus, Jesus was, was like this too, wasn't he? People didn't understand Forrest. They didn't understand the way he operated, the reason he made his decisions, the way he stuck with people, how he treated people. Nobody understood Forrest, but a lot of people were confused by Jesus, too, because Jesus also said things that other people didn't say. He spent time with people other people didn't spend time with. And sure, we know that Jesus spent time with, with leaders, and he spent time with the wealthy, and he spent time with those who were, had incredible influence in their world. But Jesus was just as likely to spend time with people who were on the fringes, and people who were struggling, and people who made mistakes, and people who were sinners. And just like Forrest went to that strip club, not to not to, for his own purpose, but to spend time with Jenny, Jesus did the same thing. And, I, and we can abstractly say that Jesus spent time with prostitutes, but think of the stigma that came with that. You know, I couldn't even show that clip in church, but Jesus would have been there. It's kind of funny, isn't it? The things that Jesus would have done that church people don't. And, and we see this too. Jesus actually addresses this at one point because he gets so much criticism uh, in the first century. Yeah, he actually says this in Matthew chapter 11. He says it, I think, in Luke 2. But he says this, Yet the human one, or the Son of God, came eating and drinking. So I've spent time with people. I've enjoyed eating. I've enjoyed, uh, you know, drinking with people, having some wine, spending time with folks. And people say this. They say, look, a glutton and a drunk. This is the criticism Jesus got. Look how Jesus spends his time. What a glutton. He eats too much. What a drunk. He's drinking with the, the, with the wrong people. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. People didn't understand him. But listen to what Jesus says. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. Now, there's something else in this verse that I think is fascinating. Not only is it that he had a lot in common with Forrest and he was criticized and misunderstood just like Forrest, but there's something else here too. Because this last line here, actually, it's got some wisdom for us. Another way of saying this is wisdom is, let's go to the next slide here. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. Now, if we summarize this a little bit, it might, it might read like this, this next one. Wisdom is what you do, not what you think. Wisdom is what you do, not just what you think. And if you summarized it even more, it might read like this. Wisdom is, as wisdom does. Because if you think about it, this is exactly what Forrest's mom is saying. That Jesus and Forrest's mom, they're both kind of saying similar things. Because Jesus is saying, wisdom isn't just being smart. It's about making wise choices. You learn who's wise, not by who talks well, but by looking at someone's life. That's how you know what wisdom looks like. What does someone's life look like? And Forrest's mom said the same thing. Stupid is as stupid does, which is her encouragement to her son who's got a low IQ. And why is it encouragement? Because she's saying IQ has nothing to do with how stupid or smart you are. It's the decisions you make that show if you're stupid. Stupid is as stupid does is, her, is his mom's way of saying you don't know what's stupid until someone does something stupid. It's not just your IQ. And what's funny is we all know people who are brilliant. Brilliant, right? Think of a person you know that's brilliant. And we all know people who are brilliant 
who have done dumb stuff, right? I, we, have a, we have a family lineage kind of thing where my great-grandfather was, uh, you know, he was well, rich and famous and connected in New York, and they had like all the, the bells and whistles and sent kids to Ivy League schools, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he divorced his wife as she was dying, and he married his nurse, and he left his entire inheritance to the nurse, and he abandoned his family at the end of his life. For a brilliant guy, that's pretty dumb. You know what I mean? Like, like some of the smartest people I know can do these mental gymnastics to make decisions that are actually really dumb, really stupid. And Jesus is saying the same thing. Oh, you're judging me for the people I'm hanging out with? Well, we'll see what your life turns out. We'll learn how wise you are by how, what you do with your life. It's what we do, not just how smart we are, that decides whether or not we're wise. And the Bible supports this, and Jesus supports this. And it's a fascinating way to think about it. And I think it's one of those things that sometimes, especially in, in our Western culture, where we can delude ourselves, that there's, there's well-meaning people who think that they're doing a good job, but it's just because they think they're doing a good job. You think you're smart. You think you're wise. You think you're good. But is what you think about yourself who you are? Or is it what you do with your life that shows who you are? And this is the challenge that we see from the Gospels and the challenge that we see from Jesus. Now, as we continue the story, Forrest and Bubba get sent off to Vietnam where he and Bubba meet this guy named Lieutenant Dan. And he's their boss. Here's a picture of him, actually. And Lieutenant Dan uh, is, uh, is courageous and brave and smart, and he cares about, he's actually a pretty good leader for these guys, and he keeps his troop together, and he tries to do the best, or his uh, platoon together, and he tries to do the best he can for them. But after several uneventful months, their platoon was ambushed by the Viet Cong, and several soldiers were wounded and killed, and in the confusion, Forrest initially is ordered to retreat, and he's separated from his platoon, and, uh, but after becoming concerned for his best friend, Bubba, his best good friend Bubba, he runs back into the fray looking for him. And there he discovers Lieutenant Dan, who's been hurt, and discovers some other soldiers. And he runs them out of there. And he finally finds Bubba. And he runs out and he retrieves Bubba and manages to carry him away from the combat area before it was hit by a napalm blast from an airstrike. But sadly, Forrest holds Bubba as he takes his last breath. And his last words being, I want to go home. Years pass, and eventually Forrest is, re is uh, recognized and receives a Medal of Honor. And he goes on TV, and at this point, uh, life has changed a little bit, and things have changed, and, and Forrest actually meets Lieutenant Dan again. But he hears him before he sees him. And the, the clip we're about to show, he says, that's, he hears a voice, and he says, that's Lieutenant Dan. And he turns around, and he sees a different guy. Take a look.
pardon the language. Um, but Lieutenant Dan, like a lot of our veterans, came back with wounds and scars, some seen and some unseen. And they do a really good job here of capturing the frustration that Lieutenant Dan has about his life and about how his life has turned out. And he's being offered hope by these guys at the VA, right? He says, they're all talking about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it, it lands, it feels hollow to him because it's not helpful. It's not helpful to him. And we, we see Forrest almost comically be like, well, I'm going to heaven. And, and, and that feels hollow to him too. And Lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan, like that's all Forrest can offer is just to be there. But we actually see it make a difference. In just a few minutes later, see, Forrest ends up getting discharged and uh, ends up going back home, and he takes all of his finances and he, that he saved up over the, over the years, and he buys a shrimping boat because he had promised Bubba that he'd be a shrimp boat captain with him. Now, Lieutenant Dan hears about this plan, and he says, the day you're a shrimp boat captain is the day I come be your number two. And well, it turns out that he found out Forrest actually had bought a shrimp boat, and so Lieutenant Dan comes down to Alabama, and he helps Forrest become a shrimp boat uh, guy. And they're, they don't exactly have a great time of it. So uh, see their efforts as they uh, figure out how to do the shrimp boat thing. Take a look. What a scene, right? Lieutenant Dan up on the, I don't know, the mast, something up with some boat talk, something on the top of the thing, screaming at God in the middle of this hurricane. And you know, our church sensibilities might initially look at that and think, oh, how inappropriate or how sacrilegious and how dare he scream at God like that. Ah, oh, but I love seeing this scene in here because it's such a great illustration of how cathartic these moments can be for people. That sometimes we think that our relationship with God always has to be this positive relationship or we always have to talk in a certain way to God. And yet what we see here is we see Lieutenant Dan strip away all those sensibilities and just present his raw self to God. And he's screaming at this storm and saying, you versus me, let's go. And he finally gets it all out, all of the grief, all of the suffering, all of the loss, all of the, the struggle, and he gets it all out there and clears the air with God. 
And the movie ends up taking this turn where all of a sudden all these shrimp boats are destroyed and somehow they manage to outlast the hurricane and they come into port here and and there's no other boats and all of a sudden they have all the shrimp they could ever want and their business becomes successful and it changes the trajectory of their business and of their lives. And you see this scene where later on where Lieutenant Dan has a totally different demeanor. His wildness has left his eyes. He's more at peace with himself. And he looks at Forrest one day. He gets out of his wheelchair. He gets up on the side of the boat. And he says, Forrest, I never thanked you for saving my life. And then he jumps in the water without saying thank you. (laughs) And he starts swimming away. And that was his way of saying thank you to Forrest. Of realizing that life is actually a box of chocolates. It's actually a gift. And that Forrest didn't take something from him when he pulled him out without his legs but that he still had some life left in him, and it was still a gift. And what's so cool about that is it wasn't the priest with the fancy words that changed his life. It wasn't the guys who were talking about Jesus that changed his life. It was a man with a simple faith who walked by his side as long as it took and helped him come to terms with his life and his faith. That is what Forrest gave to Lieutenant Dan, that a well-educated priest and well-meaning people at the VA tried to give him. It was a friend who was by his side to help change his life. And you know, that's really the summary of the movie. It goes on. If you want to, if you are are caught up now and you don't remember how it ends, go ahead and watch the rest of it on your own. The movie is so fantastic. And there's a million other clips we could have used today. But this is, this is really the essence of who Forrest was. Someone who found those few people and loved them well and clung to them and walked with them through these different stages of life. And so I want to end today by reading that passage again about what love looks like. And and I want to invite you to actually read this together with me. And if you're watching at home, feel free to read along with us here. And, And as we're reading this, I just want you to ask yourself this question. What's keeping me from this? What's keeping me from being like this? Is it my pride? Is it my smarts? Is it, is I'm, am, I, am I jaded? What's keeping me from being like this to the people I love? Let's read it together. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, and endures all things. And if you're here today as you're leaving in just a couple minutes, we've got little business cards printed with just this passage on it. And if you need a reminder of what love looks like, I wanted to get Forrest Gump face on it, but we just had space for the scripture. But if you want to know what love looks like and you want to remind yourself of what, what we're being invited to live like, like, you know, what the Christian faith looks like in someone's life, put it in your wallet, put it on your nightstand, put it on your mirror, put it in your car, put it somewhere where you can be reminded of what love looks like when we follow Jesus. And I hope this will be helpful for you. And just as a reminder, friends, Forrest might have been a simple man, but he knew what love was. And it doesn't matter who we are. God invites all of us to use our simple lives to cherish them and to share them. So may we share our lives like Forrest did. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the gift of life. And we know that there are seasons that are really hard. And we know that there are times where we feel like screaming at the storm and screaming at you. And God, through the ups and the downs, through the aches and the pains and the celebrations, We just ask you to help us keep seeing the hope that you give us, to help us keep loving and to find people who love us right back. God, invite us to know what love is and to practice it every day, just like gum. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able and sing along with us on our final hymn.
Friends, thank you again for joining us for worship today. I hope that was something that was meaningful for you. Even though we're looking at these films that may you may not even realize have these religious messages, there's something that I hope that you took away from this movie. And if you haven't watched it, go watch it. There's some other good points we didn't get to. So with that being said, I want to remind you, if you're a guest with us today, we'd love to know you were here. If you'd fill out this Connect card in the seat back in front of you, we've got a gift for you at our welcome booth. And uh, we're just glad we're able to worship together. So I invite you now to receive this benediction. So have you, as you leave this place, know that God invites you to take your one precious life and to share it and to savor it and to realize that you offer this world something special. And so find those few people and love on them well. And go with God and go in peace. Amen. God bless, friends. We'll see you next week.